Hi, everyone. Um, thank you all for coming out here tonight and coming to the Central Library. Um, before I have um, do the introduction of the speaker, I just wanted to remind everybody that we are filming this lecture for Arlington TV tonight. So if you do have a question, I will be bringing a microphone around. And if you can, ask your question into the mic so it can get caught by the camera. Um, but now I'll introduce our speaker. Eric Buckland is the author of five books, all of which tell the stories of men who rode with Mosby's Rangers and include Mosby's Kedats Rangers, as well as a four book series called Mosby Men. Buckland retired from the US Army in 1999 as Lieutenant Colonel after tw a 22 year career spent primarily in special forces and other special operations assignments. Some of his awards include the Master Parachutist Badge, the Special Forces Combat Diver Badge, and the Combat Infantry Men's Badge. He is currently employed at the Office of National Drug Council Policy as an international policy analyst with a focus on border security issues. It is my pleasure to introduce Eric Buckland. Thank you very much, and thank you for having me, th uh, me this, here this evening. Uh, remember, this is being filmed, so if you throw anything at me, it's going to be on, 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 on camera. Uh, for the last several years, uh, I've been studying uh, the men who rode with Mosby's Rangers. Uh, that, of course, has allowed me to learn a lot about the, their operations, but my real passion has been the life, uh, the lives of, of those men who rode with Mosby during the war, uh, and after. Uh, so what I would like to do after a little bit of in introduction uh, to the Rangers, who they were and what they were, uh, will be to share, you, share with you some stories about some of those Rangers. Now, they were an excep exceptional group of young men, uh, many of whom went on to become doctors and lawyers, a good number of ministers, three or four millionaires at least, uh, but I, I, I'm not going to tell simply success stories tonight. I, I will share with you some stories about some of the more colorful rangers as well. Do you see the, the quote at the bottom of this slide? As glides and sees the shark rides Mosby through green dark. Does anyone know where that is from? It's from an epic, literally epic poem called The Scout Toward Aldi. It was written by Herman Melville, the author of Moby Dick. Uh, during the Civil War, he had decided he was going to be the poet laureate of the war. That didn't take, so he went ahead and wrote some book about a whale. Uh, but, but the, and you can find this poem, The, the Scout Toward Aldi, uh, online. It is long but it is basically based on an actual event where a Union Patrol went into Mosby's Confederacy. And it's, he paints this wonderful picture of the, uh, the fear inspired by Mosby's men. There are this aura sort of swirling around the Union Cavalry as they continue to head west into Mosby's Confederacy. And you get a real feel, feel for the, the, the fear that Mosby's men put in the Union Cavalry when they did venture into their home turf. The Mosby's, uh, Mosby's Rangers were the brainchild of John Singleton Mosby. He came up with the concept of how they were to be used. Uh, he came up with the operations, uh, how the unit would function, and he led, commanded that unit from start to finish, January of 1863 until he disbanded the unit on April 21st, 1865. You can see here at the bottom of the slide the general purpose of what he was trying to do. It was never the Rangers' mission to take on an enemy unit face to face, as you see in major, the major cavalry battles such as Brandy Station, or to take on massive numbers of infantry. The Rangers generally uh, operated in smaller groups, 40, 50 uh, men, uh, and they used surprise, violence of action, and superior firepower to conduct their operations. From start to finish, Mosby's plan was simply to annoy the Union Army, cut their lines of communication, and disrupt 
as many of their activities as possible, all with the thought of drawing forces away from the main battle area, wherever Robert E. Lee's army was, drawing Union forces away from the fight with Lee to even those odds a little bit more and just to cause trouble for the Union Army up closer to Washington City. And Mosby and the Rangers were very successful in that. Now, you see a photo or a, a drawing here with Mosby walking with another man. Uh, the, the taller man with the red cape, of course, is Jeb Stewart. Jeb Stewart was John Mosby's mentor. He's the one who gave him an opportunity to begin his career as a partisan ranger uh, and then supported him throughout that career and course, until, of course, he was mortally wounded at Yellow Tavern. Mosby, up until that time, had reported directly to Jeb Stewart. There was no other chain of command. After Stewart was mortally wounded and, and died, Mosby reported directly to Robert E. Lee. A pretty impressive. But really, that could happen in most cases, or in this case, because they were away from the main battle area. There wasn't a lot that Mosby had to coordinate with Robert E. Lee because they were not anywhere near each other in most cases. So Mosby was not going to get in Lee's way. Plus, the Rangers were essentially self-sufficient. Everything they had, other than when a, a young man showed up wanting to join the Rangers, he needed to have a horse. And if he didn't have a pistol, someone could probably get him one fairly quickly. But he had to have a horse. And from there, everything pretty much that they had or used for the rest of the time as a Ranger was courtesy of the United States government. Things they captured from Union troopers in the many fights that they had. This is a brief synopsis. You might be surprised to learn that during the two year period or so that the Rangers were in existence from start to finish, Mosby had almost 2,000 men who had ridden with him at one time or another. Many men would come from other units maybe on a scout from their regiment, they join in with the Rangers for a raid or two, and then they go back to their unit. Men who had been wounded and gone home to heal up would join Mosby for a raid or two, hoping possibly to get a horse or a saddle or whatever they might need. Uh, other men would ride with Mosby once and just decide it wasn't to their liking. But almost 2,000 men were with him at one time or another. 800 were officially mustered into the unit at the end of the war. But again, he worked, Mosby worked in a decentralized fashion. And rarely would he gather more than 100, 150 men. The largest group he ever had for one raid was in the Berryville wagon train raid in later 1864 when he had 350 men. That was a huge number for Mo Mosby to operate with. It was, a, it was a great victory in that fight for Mosby. The numbers below 100, 456 captured, 112 killed in action, mortally wounded in action, died in prison or, or executed, and 103 being wounded are low. But that's the best I could come up with through the records, the records I was able to, to find. Being wounded uh, as a ranger was just part of doing business. And there are stories where in the middle of a fight, a ranger will get his finger shot off and it's out, that hurts, and he continues on with the fight. It, it didn't stop the action. 456 men uh, captured. Uh, initially, they would be exchanged or paroled. Later on in the war, especially the last six months or so of the war, the Union officials, the Union government had had it with the rangers and they began to ship them to Fort Warren in Boston Harbor. And they would ship them there in shackles under heavy guard, very, very heavy guard, and, and the instructions were that the men were not to be released or exchanged or paroled for any reason, for they were dangerous and desperate men. And almost 200 men were held at Fort Warren at the end of the war and would actually not be paroled until the middle of June. Uh, almost two months after, or a little over two months after Robert E. Lee had surrendered at Appomattox. Again, uh, being wounded uh, was just part of being a ranger. And one ranger I will talk about tonight was actually hit 12 times while he was with Mosby. The other one listed here, seven, 
uh, ended up blind because of the w in one eye because of one of the wounds. But again, it was unless you were pretty much on your deathbed, it, you didn't get a lot of sympathy from the other boys. It was just part of the way uh, they did things. Now. Again, my, my interest is, is really in the, in the individual rangers. I'm fascinated by John Mosby, but there have been several books written about him. Uh, he was an extraordinary man. And I think one of the things that, that highlights that more than anything else is the fact that in 1992, John Singleton Mosby was in the first group of men, the first class inducted into the United States Army Ranger Hall of Fame in Fort Benning, Georgia. Pretty exceptional for a man who was not in the United States Army, made his name fighting against it. Nonetheless, he was inducted in that first class. And you may recognize some of the names here. Robert Rogers from the French and Indian War, that's really where the Rangers today, the U.S. Army Rangers, take their lineage. James Rudder, a lieutenant colonel at the time when he was commanding a Ranger Battalion, uh, those men who scaled the cliffs at Point de Ho on Normandy Beach on D-Day. Frank Merrill of Merrill's Marauders. William Darby actually put together the first modern day Ranger Battalion, the first Ranger Battalion in World War II. And Arthur D. Simons, who was in the 6th Ranger Battalion in the Pacific during World War II, later in Special Forces, and he would be the on-ground or forces commander uh, on the ground in Sante, North Vietnam, when a group of American Special Forces went into North Vietnam in an attempt to, to free uh, several POWs. Unfortunately, the POWs had been moved, but there were somewhere between two and 600 Chinese advisors uh, who were in the area, and, and as far as I know, very few of them actually returned from that home, uh, from that trip to Vietnam. The, the, the U.S. forces returned uh, with no wounded whatsoever. It was an unsuccessful raid in the fact that they didn't rescue the POWs, but because of the fear put in the North Vietnamese, they began to tre treat our POWs much better. An extraordinary group of guys, and John Singleton Mosby is one of them. Now, I think there were four reasons, in addition to having Mosby as the commander, I, I think there were four primary reasons why the Rangers were so successful. Uh, the first was Mosby took advantage of a thing called the Partisan Ranger Act that was passed in April of 1862. The big, the key point to the Partisan Ranger Act is was that partisan ranger units, be they cavalry or infantry, would be a formal part of the Confederate Army. Officers would be duly commissioned. The men would be paid in the same way that the regular Confederate Army were paid. The big difference was if you were in a partisan ranger unit, anything you took on a raid, anything you captured, you could either keep or if it was horses, tack, weapons, gunpowder, things of that nature that the Confederate government needed, it could be sold back to the Confederate government for profit. Pretty good deal. Mosby knew, in addition to a man's patriotism, search for adventure, or whatever it might be, he knew men liked to have a few dollars in their pocket. And he knew this would be a way to, to draw people into the unit. And it did. And he knew they would want to stay in the unit once they got in and got a taste of that loot. So as, as, as it was a draw into the unit, it was also a hammer that Mosby could very quietly hold over their heads because if they got out of line in their behavior, they showed cowardice in the field. They, they did not conduct themselves in, as gentlemen when they were in and about the citizens uh, where they were staying. He would simply throw them out of the unit. And it, as undisciplined as that unit may have seemed as far as not drilled, everyone wore different uniforms, probably most of the officers were called by their first names, 
uh, it was a very loose type of unit, but nonetheless, there was a, an iron discipline behind it. And Mosby used that Partisan Ranger Act from start to finish. Now, that, the Partisan Ranger Act initially was thought to be a wonderful idea by the Confederate government. It turned out to be a quick pass to thuggery for a good number of units who called themselves partisan rangers. And they would prey upon uh, southern civilians as much as, an, as any, uh, anything else. And they became a real problem for the Confederate Army. Confederate generals began to complain. That went back up the chain and eventually, about 18 months after it had been passed, the Partisan Ranger Act was rescinded. And all partisan ranger units were told to muster into the nearest Confederate unit, with the exception of two units, Mosby's Rangers and McNeil's Rangers, who operated out in the Shenandoah Valley. Those two units were allowed to continue as partisan rangers, primarily because their commanders had a grip on the behavior of the men and because they had been successful in at least complementing what the main southern effort was doing uh, around Robert E. Lee's army. So from the very start, that was the way Mosby was able to fill his force and again instill a sense of discipline uh, within the men. The next was the way the men lived. You can see a, a home here. That's the home, the, the home of Adolphus Edward Dolly Richards' father. Dolly Richards would become a major under Mosby, third in command. This was his father's home, and this was his, Dolly's, safe house. The Rangers did not have camps. They stayed in private homes from the very beginning, January 1863 until the very end. The Rangers stayed in private homes, two or three or four Rangers to a home. Some of the men stayed with mom and dad. Some were staying with their aunt and uncle. Others were staying with a, a, a ranger comrade's family because that w was his good buddy. Some of the men paid room and board. Some of the men would help around the farm when they could. Uh, others stayed there because the, the southern people with whom they were staying were patriots and wanted to help the effort. It also made the southern civilians in the area, in Mosby's Confederacy, primarily northern Loudoun and Fauquier County, it made them more comfortable that there were young, armed, well-behaved, reasonably brave young men uh, in the area who could protect them in case there was any type of problem. Another advantage to staying in these homes and being in neighborhoods, although I'm sure very few of these men took any advantage of it whatsoever, were the young women who lived either in the homes in some cases or just down the street. And the number of marriages between rangers and other rangers' sisters or cousins is pretty extraordinary. Later on, rangers' children would marry other rangers' children, and I would have loved to have been at some of those family get-togethers. You know, knowing how old soldiers are 30 or 40 years later, you know, those two, two old boys sitting there looking at their youngins probably both felt and told the kids that they could have won the war themselves had they wanted to. Now, you see in the middle a Colt pistol. That was the primary weapon. That was the tool of the trade for the Rangers. They carried anywhere from two to six pistols apiece. Some carried long rifles, a carbine, uh, but only because, in the words of a few of them, it gave them more opportunity to annoy the Union troops at a further distance. They didn't carry sabers. They thought they were foolish. Although a couple European officers who would ride with Mosby did carry sabers, and you'll hear about him in, in, in just a moment. But their primary tool was the Colt 44. And they got those courtesy of the, Union uh, of the United States government. They would take them from the Union troopers when they would have fights. There's nothing the Rangers liked to see more when they began an attack or when they began to receive an attack from Union cavalry. There's nothing they enjoyed seeing more than Union cavalry drawing sabers. 
because as good as you look with that saber up over your head, maybe the, the sun catches it and you've got a snarl on your face, as good and dashing and brave as you may look with that saber, I will put two rounds in your chest and be looking for my next target before you can even swing. And so the Union Cavalry would literally be taking a knife to a gunfight. And the, the Rangers from start to finish used these pistols with devastating effect. They would not attack as you see in movies in these, these pretty columns of four. When the Rangers would begin an assault, it was like a swarm of angry hornets. Here they came, yelling, screaming, pistols out. They'd pick a target. And one of the things that, I, that I, I, I always remark about and I think about is many of these Rangers were not but 17, 18 years of age. They weren't trained killers. But once they got into combat with the Rangers, we are talking combat uh, in the distance in combat of feet on their horse and they are looking at that man they're shooting. They're looking at him in, in the face and they're seeing the dust come up on his coat when they hit him. They're seeing the life go out of his eyes and they're moving on to the next target. And God bless the infantry units that stood three, four hundred meters apart and slung lead at each other. But the Rangers, their fighting style was up close and personal. Never read too much of an impact on any of the Rangers except for one, a man named William Gideon Krigler. And it was either his daughter or his granddaughter wrote later on that he still had dreams about his wartime experiences. He was a farmer, and she had noted that often he would mount his horse and go off into the fields for much longer than he needed to. And I would imagine, as we would call it PTSD today, I imagine that Krigler, along with a good number of the other rangers, experienced that. But his was the only experience I've ever seen noted on paper. Horses, when you joined Mosby, you had to have a horse. In order to ride with him, probably a good idea to have a horse. You had to bring your own. If you didn't have one, you best go find one. From there, the rangers would make a point of capturing Union horses. That's how these men lived and died. The good number of stories about rangers having a horse shot out from under them in the middle of a fight and picking up some other horse on the battlefield. Maybe a Union horse where that trooper had been shot from the saddle. And that ranger hopping up in the saddle and then getting wounded or killed or captured because it wasn't a good horse. These, were, these men were good judges of horse flesh. They were good riders and it often meant the difference, as I said, between being killed or captured. The men would have, many of them would have a string of two, three, four horses, and they would rotate them out uh, in between operations. The money that I've shown here, the greenbacks, is just re reflect, it reflects the money that all these men had, a little bit. They weren't millionaires by any stretch. However, 60 rangers did have great luck in the fall of 1864. 60 or 70 rangers had great luck when they accompanied Mosby on a raid that became known as the Greenback Raid. And in that raid, those 70 rangers hit a Union train. On the Union train was a Union payroll master who had $176,000 in Yankee Greenback money uh, that he was taking out to pay the Union troops with. Now, greenbacks were just as good in, the, in, the Mo, in Mosby's Confederacy as they were up north. And the way that the Rangers normally did things was they would divide things out evenly. And each of those men left that raid with about $2,100 in greenbacks, and that money flowed through Loudon and Fakir for years and years. I know of at least one Ranger who paid for his, his law degree at UVA with that money. I know another ranger who most likely purchased a house with it after the war. So these men had some money. It also allowed each and every one of them to have the smartest, sharpest, spiffiest looking uniform they could possibly had made. And you can see in the photo, this group photo, the photo was taken probably in August of 1865. 
in Richmond. That puts to bed, at least in this case, the emaciated Confederate soldier in tatters. These boys don't look too bad. Not only do they look sharp, you can see how young many of them are. But the, the, the uniforms they have on in, those, in that picture and the uniforms that they would send off to Baltimore and Richmond and New York to have made for them were not for going out on raids. Those were for putting on after they had come back from a raid to go see their ranger, their ranger friend's sister at the next house down the road. So it was a good life. Again, dangerous when they would go out on operations, but in between, we had a saying in the Army, if you have nothing to do, don't do it here. And most views are the same way. If you're not on op out on an operation, go back to your safe house. You, the, the men would either be told where the next operation would be, how many days and where they were to meet, or if they were at the house and they heard gunfire, they would literally ride to the sound of the guns or because the rangers knew where everyone lived, at least within a few miles of where they stayed, if they saw a Union patrol, sort of like a jungle telegraph, the rangers would ride from house to house to house to pick up men uh, to bring them back to wherever that Union patrol is. And there's a good number of Mosby ranger fights that start with three or four rangers bumping into a Union patrol. Half an hour later, there's 20 rangers. 10 minutes later, there's 30 rangers. A few minutes later, there's 50 rangers. And the Union Cavalry started to learn. When it starts, it's not going to stop. And they frequently would push only so far, not have a lot of problems, think, OK, we're OK. And they'd turn around and go back from whence they came. Uh, but that all stemmed from the safe house concept uh, and the men looking for, for action wherever they could find it. Another key, I believe, to Mosby's success was the fact that he had tremendous subordinate leaders. As you may know, in 1862, the Confederate Army, the soldiers in the Army, were given the privilege of voting for their unit leadership. The Confederate government thought that would keep these men in the Army. They were trying to find ways to have them re-enlist and continue on in the fight. Many of the men elected were elected because they were popular or because the men knew, well, if, if Bob is the company commander or the battalion commander or the regimental commander, we, we won't have to do anything. Now that worked until they went into combat the first time and then they realized this, this isn't a good idea. But it, it, it continued on to a certain degree. Mosby started the war as a private in the Washington Mounted Rifles. That was a cavalry company from Southwest Virginia which was rolled into what would become the first Virginia Cavalry commanded initially by Jeb Stewart. Stewart would be promoted to Brigadier General, and Mosby's mentor, another mentor that he had initially as a private soldier named William Grumble Jones, who had taken him under his wing, Grumble Jones was the regimental commander. And then these elections, th this, uh, this opportunity to have elections came about, and Grumble Jones lost to a man named Fitzhugh Lee, who would go on to become a Confederate general. But Mosby and Lee hated each other. And when Lee became the commander, Mosby, at that time now a lieutenant, had been, the, had been made the adjutant by Grumble Jones, a staff position in the regiment. Mosby knew that Lee was not going to keep him on because Lee didn't like him. Mosby also knew he didn't like Lee and he didn't want to work for him, so he resigned his commission. So these elections left a very bad taste in Mosby's mouth. And when he began to have enough men to form a unit, you see, in January 1863, Mosby started with nine men. After about two weeks, they were on loan from Jeb Stewart. And he brought those nine men back to around Fredericksburg in the middle of January, 
showing some success. Stuart said, well done. You can take 15 back with you. And from there, things continued to grow. And come late May, Mosby now was up 50, 60, 70 men. And word came, you have enough men, you can become a formal unit now. And you'll be designated the 43rd Battalion Virginia Cavalry. Jeb Stewart, his mentor, told him, when you form this unit, just like the regular Confederate units, you will have elections. Mosby said, yes, sir. So on the 10th of June, 1863, he brought the four men pictured here to what was then called Rector's Crossroads. It's now called Atoka. It's right off Route 50 between Middleburg and Upperville today. He took these four men, brought them into the Caleb Rector house, and said, I'm making the four of you the officers of A Company, 43rd Battalion, Virginia Cavalry. These would be Mosby's first subordinate officers. Well, what about the elections? Mosby said, go ahead and sign your commission papers. You are the officers, captain, first lieutenant, second lieutenant, third lieutenant. He then took those four men about a quarter mile down the road to where the troopers, the rangers, had gathered knowing that something was in the wind. He called them together and said, we are forming Company A, 43rd Battalion, Virginia Cavalry. I now open the floor to nominations for officers. And he read his list of these four men and closed nominations and asked for a vote. A few of the men actually pushed back. They thought there were some other men who were better qualified. Mosby said, you're welcome to your opinion. You can have it outside of this unit. And from then on until the last company was formed in early April 1865, Company H, every slate of officers was handpicked by Mosby. Men who were brave, intelligent, who understood how he, Mosby, wanted to operate and who were respected by the men. Those are the men he picked. He had some very, very close friends in that unit. He did not play favorites. He picked based, people based on merit and merit alone. Some of his friends would make some rank. Uh, there's a case of uh, two different sets of brothers, the Richards brothers that I talked about. Dolly Richards would become a major. His big brother Tom, 10 years his senior, who had put his head, Tom Richards, who had put his head in between the saber blade of a Union officer and Mosby's body and taken that saber slice, uh, would make captain. And I'm sure Richards had to think, I'm 10 years old, my brother, I almost got my head cut off from Mosby, and I'm only a captain. The Chapman brothers, William Chapman would become second in command, a lieutenant colonel. Sam Chapman, a dear, dear friend of Mosby's, and they would stay, remain friends until Mosby passed away. Uh, Sam would only make captain. He didn't play favorites. He picked people based on merit. And these were the first four men he picked. And from then on, I think he picked only the best men in that unit to lead the companies as they were formed. The next slide would show these same four men. And in less than a year, two would be dead, two would be POWs. In fact, the captain, uh, Willie Foster, as he was known, was captured two days after he became the company commander. Um, and George White's carver was killed the day after he was made a lieutenant. The other two, the other two officers, again, were POWs and would spend the remainder of the war as prisoners. The fourth key to Mosby's success, as I mentioned before, were the men he had around him. 17, 18 years of age, average age probably was about 20 because he did have some older men, but he also had boys, but men in this case, they fought as young as 14, three or four different men who rode with him. The first 
is a ranger named Charles Henry Charlie Deer. He was 16 years old when he left the Virginia Military Institute in February of 1863. He's the ranger who would be shot 12 times in the next two, two years. In early February of 1865, he was in a fight at a place called Mount Carmel Church. It's on the west side of the Blue Ridge Mountains on Route 50, uh, where about 40 rangers had pinned approximately 110 Union Cavalry into a very narrow road with stone walls on both sides. The Union Cavalry still could not ride as well as the Rangers. And so the Union, the trooper, the Rangers were able to take advantage of the situation. They were in and out of this mass of Union uh, Cavalry jammed into this very tight area. And Charlie, as the, as the Rangers would do, was in amongst the Union Cavalry with his pistol going to work. Now the Union Cavalry were carrying carbines, Spencer repeating rifles, but things were so tight that they couldn't come up with their weapons to engage. Things were that tight, they couldn't come up to shoot, but they could swing the weapons just like a baseball bat. And they beat Charlie from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet. Many of the Rangers remarked on how banged up he was after that fight. He shook it off. April 10th, the day after, the after Robert E. Lee had surrendered at Appomattox, two companies of the Rangers are at a place called Arundel's Tavern. It's over near Burke Lake today, if you're familiar with that area. In that fight, they came up against the 8th Illinois Cavalry, and the 8th Illinois ran them off the field, beat them very badly. And as the Rangers were trying to get away, Charlie's horse, Old Thunder, went down and rolled over on top of him. He lived to be 82 years old. After the war, he would go home uh, to Rappahannock County, to Washington uh, in Rappahannock County, where he would own a boarding house and a tavern. And one of the great stories about Charlie, a little later in life, and he would, he would eventually marry and have one son uh, when he was about 40. But one of the stories I love about Charlie was on Sunday nights in the boarding house, he would have the guests down for dinner and they would sit family style at the table. And Charlie would sit at the head of the table as a father might do. And he would pass the plates out empty, whatever the meat was, uh, ham or uh, whatever beef, whatever it might be that night, normally, the, Normally the meat would be cut, put on, or sliced and put on the, the plate and passed down, but Charlie liked to pass the plates down empty because he liked to carve the meat and stab it with his knife and fling it down the length of the, of the table. And they said that he never missed. Uh, apparently one night, one of the guests, not knowing who Charlie was, made a comment about Mosby's Rangers being nothing more than cutthroats. Charlie picked up that knife, which he was very, with which he was very, very adept, went up to the guest and leaned that knife up against his throat and suggested that he might want to take that comment back. And he did. <laughs> now, he is buried in the Masonic Cemetery in Washington, Virginia. And his marker is wonderful. One side talks about being in the 43rd. Uh, the other half of the marker is his wife, Adam McGeor or Ada McGeorge uh, Deer. And on the back, the whole back is dedicated to Charlie and his exploits. He was in pretty much every well-known fight the Rangers had. But if you speak to the Rappahannock Historical Society, uh, not they, I don't believe they'll put this on paper but they were pretty adamant when I spoke with them. Uh, as wonderful as this marker is, they will tell you that my man Charlie Deer is not buried next to his wife. He apparently was a philanderer and a gambler up until his dying day. And she simply said, no, not next to me, not for the rest of, not for the rest of eternity. And one of the things I think that, that uh, kind of 
proves that to uh, even a, uh, or shows that to be true to a little more extent is the fact we visited, uh, myself and a couple friends have visited the home that he and Ada lived in. Uh, and the woman who owns the home now has all the paperwork. She's done tremendous re research on the house. And she brought all the paperwork out uh, that the family had had. And the house was in Ada's name, which was pretty unheard of back in the day. And I think it was so Charlie wouldn't gamble the house away. God, I love him. Now, one of Charlie's best friends was a man named Joe Bryan. And they became fast friends, very, very, very quickly became close friends. And in the fall of 1864, they were engaged in a fight together. And Joe had only been in the unit for a few weeks, perhaps a month. They were engaged in a fight near Upperville, a place that belonged to a man named Delaney called Oakley. In that fight, a ranger captain named Walter Franklin made some, some egregious uh, tactical mistakes and launched the rangers into a very ill-fated attack. The rangers on horses with their pistols against the 8th Illinois Cavalry dismounted with rifles behind a stone wall. Guess how that turned out. And in that fight, Charlie saw that Joe, his dear, dear friend Joe, had been hit twice. And Charlie rode out and was able to get him off the field. Several rangers were wounded, a few killed, and several captured in that fight. But Charlie was able to get his dear friend Joe Bryan off the field. Joe was wounded badly enough that he had to go home to heal up. And as he began to heal at home, he would start to ride errands for his father. And one day he was out uh, on his horse and it began to pour. And he didn't have any kind of rain gear with him. But he saw a farmhouse off in the distance and he rode up and knocked on the door. The farmer came to the door and J Joe introduced himself and said, do you have any kind of rain gear? A poncho, a slicker, a raincoat that I might borrow, buy, uh, that you could lend to me? And the farmer thought for a minute, he said, Yes, I, I, I've got something out in one of the outbuildings. And he went, the farmer went out to this building and retrieved this raincoat that was in pretty bad shape. And Joe saw it, held it up in front of himself, and he could see that it had been cut and then sewn. And for some reason, the hair on the back of his neck stood up. It, it, he wasn't sure why. And so he le lifted the collar of this rain jacket. It written in the back was T.J. Jackson, Thomas Jonathan Jackson, Stonewall Jackson. It was the coat Jackson had been wearing when he was wounded at Chancellorsville. He'd been cut off him and left. Joe bought the coat from the farmer for uh, a fairly hefty price, so much for supporting the troops and sent it home. And the coat eventually made its way back to Mrs. Jackson. Does anyone know where it is today? It's on display at the Virginia Military Institute. And I've always thought that was a, a wonderful kind of circle of life, if you will, because Joe's w closest friend during the war had been a, a cadet or a cadet at Virginia Military Institute, Charlie Deere. I think we could all agree that Charlie Deere was somewhat rough around the edges. Joe Bryan would go on to become the owner and the editor of the Richmond Times Dispatch. He would become, I, I think, a millionaire, uh, quite a businessman in Richmond, very, very well respected, traveled in the highest circles. I don't believe Charlie Deere would have ever been welcomed into the highest circles, but Joe Bryan within Richmond was, there's a park a name for him in Richmond, uh, land that his wife uh, gave after he had passed. And Joe died fairly young, about 20 years or so prior to Charlie passing. And Charlie, a r the rough, tough, shot 12 times, let, let's go drink and, and shoot our guns up in the air when we're 78 years old type of guy, wrote this wonderful 
letter to Joe Bryan's son, and it's moving. If this is not a politically incorrect thing to do, it was almost the emotion that a woman would show. That's how soft and gentle and caring this letter was from one of the toughest rangers I'm aware of, but he expressed to, to Joe Bryan's son how much he had thought of his father. There was another ranger named James Sinkler. The men called him Sink. He was a little bit older, probably pushing 30, than some of the other rangers. And he had two wonderful eccentricities that I love to share. The first is when he would be out on operations, he liked to sleep in cemeteries. Okay, well, at first you think, you know, I, I wouldn't do that, but then wait. You're out on an operation, you pull into a cemetery. What do cemeteries usually have around them? A fence or a wall. So you can ride into the cemetery and nobody in their right mind is gonna come in and bother you at three o'clock in the morning in a cemetery, especially on a dark rainy night. So you're somewhat safe and you can unsaddle your horse and let it roam free because it's within an enclosed area. So Sink would sleep in cemeteries whenever he could. And there's a wonderful story that he shared with, with some of the other rangers, and I'm sure he heard no end to this, was one night in a cemetery, he was awakened for some reason, and he looked out at the fence around the cemetery, and he saw this, this orb over the fence, and it spooked him. And he yelled, and it didn't go away. He yelled again, it didn't go away. So he drew his pistol. He fired, it didn't go away. He took even better aim this time. He fired, and it disappeared. He went back to sleep. The next morning, sun comes up, he's awake, starts to look for his horse. He can't find his horse. He walks over to the fence about where that orb had been the night before, and there was his horse, as dead as dead can be. See, it had a white forehead, and Sink had shot that horse right between the eyes and killed it right where it stood. Now the second amusing and, and fun, and I, I know most of the women will be able to identify with this, um, Sink, when he drank, which he liked to do often and heavily, liked to bite the head off, off of snakes. Now whether or not he ate the snakes, I don't know. I haven't been able to get that far. But he carried a sack of snakes around with him, tied off on, the, the, uh, on his saddle. And the men knew that he did that, and when they would catch snakes, live snakes, they'd give them to Sink, so he'd have something to chew on when he was, you know, I guess it, it's, we have our chips and, and jerky today, he had live snakes back at the time. And that, so I, that to me, just makes Sink one of the more, one of the more colorful characters uh, who rode with Mosby. The last story I, I'd like to share with you, and then we can do some questions. Um, there was a Prussian officer named Baron Robert von Massau, who rode with Mosby. Now he knew, was familiar with Harris von Bork, who was a, a Prussian officer who rode with Stuart. Robert von Massau came over, took a, a furlough from the Prussian army, took leave, came over for an adventure, to have some fun. He came over in late 1863, and was eventually sent and made his way down to Mosby's command. In the first fight he was in, he wasn't wounded and he was livid. You see, he wanted a scar. He wanted to go back with a momentum, a memento from his trip uh, to the American War. Well, the next fight he was in, that was taken care of him, uh, care, uh, that was taken care of for him uh, to the extreme. I mentioned before the Rangers didn't carry sabers. The European man who rode with Mosby did. Von Massel being Prussian, swore by his saber, and so he carried it 
uh, in the fights he went into. Before one fight, another ranger named Ben Palmer had actually turned to the Baron and said, a saber, I, I, do, do you want to die? And von Massel's response was, Palmer, a good soldier is always ready to die. And so in this fight, along today's Route 7, around Drainsville, a place called Anchor's Shop, the Rangers took on elements of the second Massachusetts. They ambushed them initially and then swept down a, a, on the second mass from a couple of different directions. Initially, the fighting was fierce, and, and the second Massachusetts was a good unit and got better and better as the war progressed. And they initially were giving as good as they got. And in the middle of this melee on, the, on, on today's Route 7, John Sewell Reed, captain one each of the second Massachusetts, sees this fairly large man with a, a large saber. Uh, von Masso, as, as was von Bork, had a much larger saber than most of the normal cavalrymen carried. And Reed, the Union officer, sees this man riding down on him with a saber, and he's relatively sure that within a few seconds his head is going to be cleanly removed from his shoulders, and he throws his hands up in surrender. Now, back in the day, when that would happen, you would be waved to the rear. You're a prisoner. Go wait. We'll pick you up later. And that's what von Massau, riding with Mosby's Rangers, did to Reed, commanding the element of the 2nd Massachusetts. He waved him to the rear. And as von Massau rode by him, seeking to quench the thirst of his sword's blood, Reed shot, shot him in the back. He put a round through his back, through his lung, and it was a, it was a serious wound. And von Massau, von Massau falls from his horse. He doesn't die. He's picked up by rain, the rangers, brought uh, to a, a home that the rangers know are safe, but he cannot return. It took that long for him to recover from his wounds, and he eventually would go home uh, much later in 1864 to Prussia. And that's really the last any of the rangers heard from him until about 1901, when newspaper stories, literally, this is, this is not an exaggeration, from the East Coast to the West Coast, all within a few weeks' time, this story built that von Massau was dead and he had bequeathed his millions to his ranger comrades. There were a whole lot of people suddenly who'd been with Mosby's rangers. <laughs> Mosby himself said at one time, if I had had these many men, I could have beaten Grant by myself. And literally from New York to Los Angeles, stories began to appear that Ranger so-and-so, having been a Ranger some 40 years prior, was going to be rich beyond his wildest dreams. These men hired lawyers to help get their money. Uh, they were set. Dreams. They all had dreams. And the story continued to build and went on like that for almost a year. Mosby began to wonder exactly what the situation was, and he was actually able to make contact with the dead Baron Robert von Massau because he wasn't dead. <laughs> and in the letters exchanged between them, von Massau told Mosby, it's a wonderful story, it's a wonderful idea, but Number one, as you can tell from my letter, I'm, I'm not dead. Number two, I don't have that kind of money. And number three, if I did, I'd give it, I'd leave it to my family. No one knows today, and no one knew then where that story came from. 
but you talk about viral things on YouTube today. This took off, this had legs for almost a year. The reality is, this happened in 1901 into 1902, the reality is that Baron Robert von Massau was still on active duty and would be on active duty until 1916 when he was commanding all German cavalry. And he would not die until 1921 or so. But again, that story, 20 years after he had passed the first time, he actually did pass. I do have, I've, as, I, as I stated, my, my research, my passion has been the men who rode with Mosby. And I found their stories, not just during the war, but after the war, to be very, very compelling. Uh, doctors, lawyers, a, 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 an extraordinarily high number of ministers, three or four um, millionaires. The first book I did is called Mosby's Key Debt Rangers, and it's about the 58 men who both attended Virginia Military Institute, a few before the war, a few after the war, most having been at VMI during the war and leaving it uh, to join Mosby. Those 58 men who both went to VMI and rode with Mosby. 21 of those men fought in the Battle of Newmarket with the Corps of Cadets before they left to join Mosby. Even with the men who graduated prior to the war, the average age of those men in 1864 was 18 years old. And I did that, I started that book in 2006 when my youngest son was a rat or a freshman at Virginia Military Institute. And I did that to a certain extent to honor him. Uh, and then as I went through the regimental history uh, of Mosby's Rangers, I saw these men who'd gone to VMI and I wanted to recognize them. And this, this book sort of sp uh, sprung uh, from that uh, initial desire to do something. And 2011 uh, for me was uh, sort of an exciting event that I was actually able to pin the Ranger tab, you know, the U.S. Army Ranger tab on my son who'd gone to VMI. So I have my own personal uh, key debt Ranger uh, at this point. The next, the other four books each have uh, information, stories, uh, letters, uh, newspaper articles, obituaries, patents that some of the men had uh, on 25 or so different men in each of the four books, the Mosby Men series. And plus as many of the photos uh, that I have of a man went in the book as well. Uh, it's, it's just my desire is these guys, their what they did, who they were, uh, shouldn't die, shouldn't be forgotten. Uh, I've had special forces uh, officers and senior NCOs up into Loudoun and Fauquier. I've given them tours uh, about Mosby's operations, and as I would begin to talk about how they did things 150 years ago, it's straight up irregular war, guerrilla, unconventional warfare doctrine today that they were doing 150 years ago. So it's something we can continue to learn uh, from as military people and then as, as people within just a community or society seeing how well the majority of these men integrated back into society after the war was over. Are there any questions? Yes, up near our, just outside of Rectortown, now where the highway crosses the Norfolk Southern Tracks, there's a historic marker uh, that mentions about how the Unions had captured and executed some Confederate prisoners and in turn Mosby's Rangers captured um, several Union uh, prisoners, and, but they didn't execute all of them and there was a drummer boy involved and uh, something, do you? There, there, you're probably talking about what happened at Front, uh, Front Royal okay, in September 1864. Happened, yeah. uh, the war started to become uh, a little bit ugly. Obviously, it was ugly up that time, but, but they got a, it got a little nastier. September 23rd, 1864, a small element of Rangers, about 150, hit a wagon train, or what they thought was a wagon train, except around the, the, the little mountain that the road was skirting, uh, that was a brigade of Union cavalry. So suddenly a, a great victory over this wagon train turned into a decided rout. Six Rangers were captured uh, and summarily executed. Four would be shot, two were, two were hung. Um, 
spread from, and the actual, the execution started from the southern part of Front Royal all the way to the northern end. Uh, it, it's Mosby until his dying day blamed George Armstrong Custer for giving the, uh, the order and without getting into a whole lot, he, he didn't. Uh, I really think what happened is uh, the Union troopers saw a chance for revenge and the, the chain of command really did nothing to stop it. Um, about three weeks later, a seventh ranger named Al Albert Gallatin Willis was executed as well. Uh, Mosby was wounded during this time, so he wasn't there. When he came, he wasn't there at Front Royal, and he may have, I, I don't, I'm not sure if he had come back by the time Willis had been executed, um, and the men were, the rangers wanted blood. And so about a month after Willis's execution, perhaps six weeks, there was a ranger assembly in the town of Rectortown. Mosby had cap captured tens, dozens of Union soldiers up to that time, but of all those men he had captured, 29 men had been set aside. They were all affiliated with Michigan units because Mosby had that connection with Custer in Michigan, believing Custer had, had uh, ordered the executions. And they had a lottery of the 29 men. Seven lucky winners were to be executed in retaliation for the seven rangers who'd been executed. When all was said and done, uh, and, and there's some wonderful stories tied up with that. When all sit, was said and done, three of the Union troopers were hanged. Two were shot, but did not die, and two escaped. Um, but immediately after that, Mosby sent a letter to Sheridan. He said, I've been capturing your men and treating them uh, well until you killed my people uh, in Front Royal. I've done this in retaliation and he, essentially, what do you want to do? And it stopped pretty much from there. So it, it did happen. Yeah, you know, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about after the war when Mosby was living in this area, and I believe his men were helping him financially. Is that right? Can you talk about that? L later, later on in war, um, or after the war, if you read any of the books about Mosby, especially Ramage's book, I think it's called, uh, I think it's The Gray Ghost. But after the war, Mosby uh, was a lawyer doing well. He then stumped, he became a Republican and stumped for Grant, um, and he became vilified in Virginia. Many of his former soldiers turned their backs on him. All of that happened, and then he was shot at in, in 1877 in Warrington. Uh, and just prior to that, his wife, Pauline, had died uh, as a result of the birth of their eighth child. And I think that, that crushed Mosby. Um, after he was shot at, he ended up going to Hong Kong for seven years as the U.S. consul there. Came back to the West Coast, stayed on the West Coast for 15 years, and worked for Leland B. Stanford as a lawyer. And then eventually made his way back to the D.C. area where he worked for the Justice Department and um, Bureau of Interior. And he didn't have a lot of money, and you're right, as, as, as life progressed. And men like Joe Bryan and others uh, kept him afloat. He was literally, in the last few years of his, his life, penniless. And he was the, the, the quintessential crotchety old man. Um, and younger people would come in his office in the Justice Department and, and ask him a question or say something to him, and, and most would just turn away and turn around and walk away. I mean, he was, I, I, I think that obviously the highlight of his life uh, was the war. You know, that, that was the pinnacle of his success. And, and you are right, he was, he was uh, virtually penniless. I know there's stories about Mosby's treasure, et cetera, et cetera. Well, if there was one, he never found it because he didn't have any money. And, and you, but you are right. Some of those men, even though some of his men turned their back, the guys like Joe Bryan and a few others who, who were well-to-do did help him out. Uh, I don't know that he ever asked for it, but they could see his plight and would help him out where they could. You mentioned about the second uh, Massachusetts Cavalry, right? Uh, what was that battle's name? 
What was the battle in which most of these people fought with the second? Well, that, that fight is known as uh, the fight at Anchor's Shop. Near Drainsville on Route 7. It's over by uh, the community college. And when was that? February of 64. Oh, there's a, uh, there's a sergeant of that regiment buried. His name is Al Wakefield, buried at Annand Annandale United Methodist Church. And he talks about that particular battle. He was severely wounded at uh, Tom Brook right before Cedar Creek. Yeah, they, they, were, they were routed in that yeah, fight. But, but uh, yes, but uh, he married a local woman in, in Annandale. And he, in, but but he, he, he was a reverend, Methodist reverend, and he operated in the Annandale area. But, but he talks about Mosby, about that battle. And he was a young man. Thank you very much. We are sure that I know that I really enjoyed your talk and I think everybody else did too.